Pat, thanks very much for coming on the show today. I've just finished recently reading your book, Democracy and Economic Planning. I found it really a very interesting take on planning. And perhaps it's a, a bit of an outlier, maybe in the whole socialist planning scene. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, I think probably in, in terms of the current day scene, uh, it probably would be a fair assessment because most of it is dominated by what I call electronic socialism, which is basically various forms of iterative models based on Valrhasian equilibrium attempts. And I don't find that sympathetic because I think it uh, is a, a way of sort of fetishizing the technology rather than talking about the social and political processes involved. Right. It's something that jumps out true and centre in, in your analysis that central to a communist society is, you know, is the normal interaction and self-development of the individual through the planning process. Yes, I think that's fair enough. And uh, I think that um, socialist planning inevitably is in some senses a political process because... Uh, you know, it used to be the idea, and some people still have that idea, that uh, somehow the state can represent everybody's interests. But of course, that's not right. People have different interests. They're at different stages in their lives. They do different jobs. And so the way in which they're affected by planning differs. So unless they're involved and participate in the process and interact with one another, you get a rather static, inf impersonal way of thinking about planning, which which I don't think is the way to, to interpret Marx's um, view, or for that matter, uh, the, the subtitle of my book, uh, you may remember, is uh, The Political Economy of a Self-Governing Society. And if you're a self-governing society, you're not governed by anybody else. You're governed by yourself and other people in the same or similar situations. One thing that really struck me now, I think, what you said earlier about like kind of an electronic kind of planning socialism, whatever, it's undeniably true. It seems to be the dominant form that people think about when they think of, you know, new types of socialist planning. And 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 some of those people that are in that kind of camp, they talk about cybernetics in a way that is essentially just like, you know, crude version of the thing is on a computer where I've been reading a good bit. I don't know if you are aware of Stafford Beer's work, which talks am, about yes. yeah. So it talks about the the kind of the cybernetics of the organization, and it seems that I don't know if at the time of your writing whether you had read much Beer, but it seemed very very much copacetic with a kind of organizational cybernetics. Well, yes, I mean he was uh, he was helping out. Um, with the uh, the experiment uh, in uh, Chile, the idea was, in in a way, all these electronic uh, models are an attempt, I think, to sort of replicate the Soviet model, where you get information fed in from various sources, and then the center processes that and then sends out instructions as to production units, shops, whatever, as to what they should do. And what they have to do in order to fit in with the plan. So the, the the Soviet model tried to do that, and there was a sort of degree of negotiation involved because managers of enterprises would be asked how much they thought they could produce and what inputs they'd need in order to produce it. And they then those those requests were then aggregated, and if they didn't add up, which they never did then the central planning board went back to the enterprises and asked them to revise them. And so they went back and forth a couple of times. And in the end, the idea was to get a, a plan for the whole economy with every enterprise and every retail outlet and every wholesale outlet uh, knowing exactly what they had to do in order to fit in with the overall plan. Well, that's not how life is. Yes, I, I, I read somewhere, I think that at the time they had... In the late 70s, they had 47,000 
uh, material balance targets that they were trying to solve for? Yeah, the, the material balance method, exactly. That's what it was. You could see that if you were to do that in very, very broad categories, like cons consumer goods and investment goods, it might work. But to disaggregate those, it, it, it just can't work. And one of the reasons which we may come to as we continue with the discussion is the uh, the nature of information that's involved. Yeah, let's go down that route then. So do you want to talk about this? You, you discuss ta the tacit information uh, yes. involved w within just the general running of, of operational units, say. Yes. Well, I mean, the information available to a central planning board uh, is the information that is submitted to them by the people who are the units the enterprises that are concerned and in say albert and uh, harnell's model paracon and before that uh, their earlier work the information that was submitted was on the one hand by production units and on the other hand by consuming neighborhoods and that information was created through a participatory process of the people in the production units on the one hand and people in the neighborhood communities on the other but they never talked to each other having decided what they wanted to produce or having decided what they wanted to consume that was then taken as hard data which was then assessed and if it all added up fine if it didn't then they would be asked to think again. But what they never involved was people in their different roles talking to one another. So you've never had production units and consumer based uh, neighborhoods interacting with one another, talking with one another. Now, what that does is it means that explicit information, that's to say, information that can be codified and transmitted, is what was used tacit knowledge which is the knowledge that people obtain from the experience of doing things and talking to one another that is missing there you can't convey tacit knowledge it, that's one of its characteristics it can't be codified it can't be transmitted it can only be drawn upon by the people or groups who've acquired it through experience when they're participating in discussion and that's why a my concept of negotiation between the social owners comes in. So on the one hand, the decision-making bodies of the firm or the industry or the region or whatever would have explicit knowledge, statistics and all the rest of it. But on the other hand, they would also be able to have process of negotiation between people and groups who had acquired tacit knowledge, which couldn't be transmitted they could only draw upon it to take part in the negotiations. So that's in that sense, there's an epistemological issue involved here. What is the nature of relevant knowledge? Right. And if we look at the kind of more, you know, computery, you know, electronic kind of socialist planning types uh, where the center gets all this information, it's, it's, you know, A, it'd be quite aggregated, but there's always a battle between what information is supplied from below to the center and the center, well, A, it'll be swamped with information, but B, uh, there will be a kind of an information game between the the lower levels and the center. Well, yes. And I mean, again, in the Soviet experience, you had a sort of bargaining process because the managers of enterprises would say they could produce less than they thought they actually could produce and demand more input than they really needed. And the center was aware of this. And so the interaction between the two was a bargaining process. But in the end, the bargaining process was cut short because the center decided and allocated targets, planned targets to the relevant units. Yeah, so th you started off the book, Pat, with some very interesting examples of how planning is done you broke down planning in capitalist economies i found it very very interesting there's an excellent early chapter you have on the nature of planning in world war ii for the british war effort 
you want to yes. give us an overview there? Because I think it's extremely interesting. Well, I mean, during the, the war, there were a number of interesting factors about this. The first was that gradually the economy had to be adapted to the war effort, i.e. to producing armaments of various sorts, but also to producing the food, the materials, the uniforms, etc., that the military had to be supplied with. On the other hand, uh, there had to be a supply of consumer goods, consumables, to the civilian population. And therefore, it became clear that you had to direct enterprises in terms of what they were going to produce and how much they were going to produce. And of course, you didn't always get it right. But broadly speaking, the allocation of resources was decided in terms of this single goal of the war effort. And one interesting aside of that was that because in order to maximize the war effort, war production, you needed everybody to be as enthusiastically involved in the production process as, as possible. So at that time, the Communist Party, which had a very strong presence in industry through the shop stewards movement and so on, that was regarded as part of the essential war effort because they could use their influence in the production process to encourage workers to take production seriously and to do the best they could. So, for example, uh, my parents, well, my, my father, who at that time was the district secretary of what was called the Lancashire and Cheshire District Committee of the Communist Party, when he moved to Manchester to take up that post, he was allocated a council-owned house. It wasn't actually a council house, but it was a council-owned house for us to live in because he was regarded as contributing to the war effort. <laughs> now, you know, you never get something like that, that nowadays. <laughs> but um, so the thing is that, that the information that's needed can only really be supplied to complement the explicit information, if you like, the statistical information, can only really be supplied by people who have participated and in the process of participating have acquired the tacit knowledge which they draw upon. The classic example, as I'm sure you know, of tacit knowledge when you're beginning to teach it is learning how to ride a bike. And you could be told and read about uh, how to ride a bike as many times as you like, but until you actually try doing it and learning by doing it, and it becomes internalized, you can't do it, you fall off or you, etc. So that's, you, that you draw upon your tacit knowledge when you're riding the bike, once you've learned it, once you've been through the experience of participating and trying to do that. And uh, the, the similar thing uh, happens in, in all walks of life. I mean, if you uh, join a, a, a meeting, like, say, the board of directors, or, there was a very interesting book by a woman called Edith Penrose, on the growth of the rate of growth of the firm. And her analysis was the, the thing that provided a limit to the size of the firm was how fast the managerial team could be expanded. And it couldn't be expanded merely by adding a new person to the managerial team because that person had to learn how the managerial team worked, how they could participate in it, and then draw upon that tacit knowledge. And that took time. It couldn't just be by adding somebody. They had to have the experience of participating in the work of the committee. So that's the sort of argument that I think electronic socialism done, doesn't take into account. When you're talking about the, the war effort, there was a, a point you made I thought that was very very important when we get to these type of things is that the system you said worked primarily through consent and the commitment of the people to making it work and it seems that's kind of an overwhelming necessity for any kind of a, a working economy 
that a an economy that is like alienating of a kind of a center top down here's your instructions go and do it it seems like that it wouldn't be very good at generating a commitment from people no and in fact what it does is create a sense of alienation i mean people are alienated from one another because they're often competing against one another as well as cooperating it creates a sense of alienation from the product because you never know where the inputs into the product come from and where the product's going and it so in general it also by the way creates a sense of alienation from non-human nature hence we have the climate and biodiversity crises that we're currently living through so at the time when you're writing one of the most popular kind of reform movements in the Eastern Bloc countries was market socialism. Yes. What 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 do you see as the the major problems uh, problems with uh, market socialism as an alternative to the central planned model? Well, the problem with market socialism is that in different ways either by state ownership or by uh, worker self-management, you have a situation in which firms, productive enterprises, are competing against one another. So what those forms of ownership may do is to get rid of exploitation because they're not producing profits, which are then siphoned off to owners. In the case of the state, well, if there's a surplus the state has it to use and if it's a a worker cooperative they have it to decide what to do with rather than private owners so you could argue that market socialism does get rid or in principle can get rid of exploitation what it can't get rid of is the interdependence of units competing against one another which produces a what Morris Dobb called drawing upon work that was already around. The second sort of uncertainty uh, when you're making decisions. The first set of uncertainty, sort of uncertainty, is you don't know what new raw material is going to be discovered in 10 years' time. That's just uncertainty. But the, the other sort of uncertainty is that you don't know what your competitors are doing because there's no interaction between you, you're competing against one another. Yet what they're doing affects the outcome of what you're going to do. So that uncertainty, the result of the operation of market forces, is what market socialism doesn't get rid of. And the the new economic mechanism in Hungary that you referred to had exactly that problem. Uh, What happened was that there was gradually more and more independence given to firms, managers of firms, to decide what they were going to produce and how and so on. But the result of that was that it caused problems because of the interaction. They weren't cooperating to decide on a plan for the industry as a whole. They, they were competing against one another. And in, in order to do that, the state had to intervene to try to correct for the adverse effects of this competition. So if one one enterprise decided to double its capacity, that would affect the ability of another enterprise located somewhere else to continue producing as much as it did. And that would then cause local problems for the community in which the second enterprise was based. So various restrictions had to be imposed on enterprises, which, if you like, you could say, cut across the reason for having market socialism in the first place, which is supposed to be the incentive provided to each enterprise to produce what consumers want. But if you're thinking of an investment for the next five or 10 years, and you don't know what your competitors are going to be doing, you have no real information about how your 10-year or 5-year investment is going to plan out because you don't know what the effect on the market will be of what other enterprises are doing. So that's the second sort of uh, of, uh, 
uncertainty. Given that, you need some sort of planning, which is not market socialism. You can't have planning in market socialism because planning implies some sort of agreed broad definition of what should happen within a particular industry or a particular sector or even a particular economy. Right, it's interesting. You have some interesting statistics in there in that chapter about just how popular, say, the worker councils were in Yugoslavia up until like the mid-60s. Yes. And as the market became more pop, more uh, a policy tool, you know, as it became more dominant, the market, the popularity uh, went down, like the participation of workers and and the popularity, there was a statistic you had here, which is really stark statistic, was, I think, of the Yugoslav leave of communists, support for them, the popularity of them went from three quarters of the population in 1974 to one third in 1983. And it kind of shows like the necessity of a communist for future society has to be a working economy or else it's, it's not long for the it's not long for the world. That's right. And, and one of the consequences in Yugoslavia, I mean, as you know, first of all, Tito broke with Stalin and moved towards worker self-management. But then marketization was introduced, not complete marketization, but more and more elements of marketization. And what happened was that um, the constituent republics of the Yugoslav Federation were at different levels of development. And those that were most developed were the ones that did best in market competition. And it just so happens, well, not just so happened, I mean, we can we know why it happened, that Slovenia, which was the one closest to the West, was the most developed. And that was the uh, republic when it began to break up that first broke away from Yugoslavia. Uh, and not surprisingly, not, not, not accidentally, uh, one might say, it was the first country to recognize the breakaway was Germany. So this was a concerted move. I'm not saying it was a pre-thought through conspiracy, but it was a way in which the capitalist Western powers intervened in the process of Yugoslav disintegration in order to cause the country to disintegrate and to further that. But the, the, the point about marketization is that it creates inequalities between different parts of the country, different parts of the economy, because some do better than others. There is a, a, a quote you have in the book by Alec Nove, a British, I suppose we call him a, mar, a type of market socialist, a kind of a, yeah. a, yes. a, a re, wanted reform in the Eastern Bloc, where he yeah. said, it's a good quote he has. There are horizontal links in brackets, the market, and there are vertical links, hierarchy. What other dimension is there? You have a, a good repast to uh, that point. I think here we need to introduce the concept of subsidiarity, that decisions have to be made at the most local level, which is consistent with all the groups that are going to be affected in a significant way by the decision, actually taking part in the decision, so that they contribute to the, making the decision. And having done so, they are more committed to it than they would be if it had just been imposed upon them. And the other thing about that is that in the course of negotiating with other groups that are going to be affected, they don't just stick to the position that they had, i.e. their preferences aren't given in stone. In the course of negotiating with others, they learn how other people are going to be affected, how they're feeling, what the impact on them will be, and therefore they change their preferences because they want to have, as you always have in any negotiation, a bit of give and take. And so in the end, what you have is a decision that pretty well everybody who has taken part in the negotiation can live with. And in that sense, you overcome this problem of horizontal links and vertical links. What you have is, if you like, interactive links. 
Right. You you said the way you put it, I'll, I'll quote you here now, Pat. OK, uh, this is what you said. There is no other dimension, but vertical links do not need to be hierarchical in any authoritarian sense. And horizontal links do not need to be market based in the sense of being coordinated ex post by the invisible hand of the market forces. Both can be based upon negotiated coordination. Exactly. Yeah. So fundamental to all this, I suppose, Pat, is the is the idea of the socialization of production as opposed to a nationalization of production. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Well, I mean, my model is 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 based upon, I suppose it starts with the concept of social ownership as opposed to state ownership or worker ownership. Social ownership, the social owners are the groups of people who are going to be significantly affected by the decisions and activities of the enterprise. And that, that, that will obviously mean that the social owners are different at different levels of decision making. So when it comes to the use of an enterprise's existing capacity, then the social owners are the workers, in the enterprise, consumers or users of what the enterprise produces, the locality in which the enterprise is based, other enterprises in the industry that will be affected by the activities of this enterprise. And then in addition to that, people who are concerned with biodiversity, people who are concerned, groups that are concerned with non-human nature and the impact of the enterprise's activities on non-human nature. So they come together to negotiate what to do in terms of making use of the enterprise's existing capacity. However, if you're talking about expanding the enterprise, i.e. through major investment, or shrinking the enterprise through major disinvestment, or even closing the enterprise, then it's not just the people that I've been talking about just now, the groups that are affected, but all the other enterprises in the industry will be affected, all the other localities where there might be an expansion capacity by the enterprise or a reduction, they will all have a say in the decision. And they will then be social owners at that level. And then again, if you take sort of how is the total output capacity of an economy to be used? Is it to be used for private consumption? Is it to be used for social consumption? Is it to be used for investment? And if so, what sort of investment? So at that level, there will be groups representing all these different uses that could be made of the economy's productive capacity, putting in their arguments as to why they need this percentage share or that percentage share. And again, there has to be an agreement reached through negotiation as to what would be a broadly sensible allocation of the capacity that the economy is able to make use of when it's producing. So in other words, social ownership is in a way based upon this concept of subsidiarity which incidentally, as you probably know, comes from the Catholic Church originally. Not that it was necessarily always observed, but uh, nevertheless. So social ownership based upon the principle of subsidiarity is in a way a different way of describing the socialization of production. Right. And if negotiation is not the basis, then yes. in some level it has to be like order driven top yes. down. Yes, or 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 the market, or, d d or the market exactly. Yes. Yeah, right. So, so you're right. So, so once you've established the concept of social ownership based upon subsidiarity, you then also have to say that coordination at the different levels is based upon a process of negotiation, which is why I call the model negotiated coordination. You have to have coordination. But it doesn't have to be market coordination or top-down coordination. It can be negotiated coordination. 
Right, like if we take the example of, say, closing down the mines in Wales or England in the 80s yes. or whatever, where the individual profitability metric for a mine, say, or whatever, would be what drove that closure. But if you were to look in the round, in the whole social impact, it would be incredibly negative. And so what we're seeing here is that you have processes that are able to take into account yes. in, a, in a holistic way the totality of the social system or where it's impacted and that, that is the basis upon which yes. decisions about expansion disinvestment blah 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 are made yeah and if you think about it in terms that what one takes from conventional mainstream neoclassical economics which of course i spent a lot of my life teaching i feel your pain <laughs> you could argue that social ownership internalizes what within the neoclassical framework is thought of as externalities. So all these other impacts which aren't taken account of in the narrow profit-seeking decisions of privately owned capitalist enterprises are internalized by expanding the groups that constitute the owners to include all those that would in neoclassical uh, economics be thought of as externalities either external benefits or external costs yeah so you make that distinction we touched on a little bit before but you make a clear distinction when we talk about the market you split it into kind of two elements you talk about market exchange which is just the buying and selling of products and then also market forces would you like to expand a, a little bit on that dichotomy and its importance yes well i think it's it's, it's extremely important because there's a sense in which markets need to be deconstructed into a market exchange and market forces. Now, market exchange has existed for, well, most of human history, not all of it, perhaps, but most of it. But it was always peripheral. And most economies were, in one form or another, subsistence based. So the economic units produced what they themselves used. And then on the margins, they would exchange with other units. Uh, so you had to trade and so on. Now, that's completely different from market forces, which is a system in which the entire economic structure is shaped and changed by the operation of market forces, by competition, meaning that those that succeed flourish, those that do well flourish, those that don't do so well don't flourish. And that brings about a change in resource allocation from one industry to another, to take the case of coal. I mean, even if this hadn't been a deliberate political policy on the part of the Thatcher government to destroy the National Union of Mine Workers, prior to which they built up vast stocks of coal so that when the strike came, uh, they could draw upon that and it wouldn't cause the whole economy to collapse. But that's a side effect. But I mean, the, the, whether Thatcher had set out as she did to destroy the NUM and the coal industry, because of cl the climate change issues, which were just beginning to make themselves felt, the coal industry would have had to decline, just as at the moment, you know, there's pressure, not just because of the Russian-Ukrainian war and so on, to cut back on the use of oil. But so when that happens, if it doesn't happen in a planned way, you get what you got in England and Scotland and Wales, which was the basically the destruction of local communities as the mines closed and nothing really replaced them. So you've got to recognize that market exchange and market forces are completely different things. The one is, if you like, a facilitator of exchange at the margins of what are essentially subsistence economies of one sort or another. But market forces are economies where the whole structure of production is shaped, changed by the pursuit of profit and that means that you can get areas where there's overheating 
because there's too much activity and so there's a shortage of jobs. And the converse of that is you get areas that are depressed because nothing comes in to replace what has gone. Now, when I say nothing, it's not true that that would be the case forever, although often <laughs> it lasts for a very long time. Because the, the standard view is, well, you know, if one industry closes, that means there'll be a surplus of labour, that means wages will be lower, that means new enterprises will be attracted in. Uh, and so, well, it may be, but that could take 50 or more years. And what happens in between? So that's the, that's the difference between market exchange and market forces. So there was something else in the book that you said that I think is very important, whereby you make clear that the various both individual consumers, but also productive consumption have the ability to choose their inputs. Do you want to yes. explain why that's so important? Well, the thing is that if you're thinking of, and this is one of the, the major Austrian school of economics arguments that the market mechanism is the best way to promote innovation. And if you're thinking of enterprises being allocated inputs, depending upon their existing capacity and the use that they're currently making of it, there's not much incentive for change. But if enterprises are able to look around and decide whether there's either a cheaper or a better source of inputs, then that would then provide some sort of encouragement for enterprises that are producing those inputs to think about, well, can we produce them better, cheaper? And in that sense, it would increase efficiency. So you'd get a more efficient use of available resources. Now, that's not everything. You know, you could have a situation in which an enterprise decided that it wanted a shorter working week for its workers. And that would mean that it would have to charge more or produce less. Well, OK, it would have to bear the consequences of that. But by and large, competition does provide, on the one hand, an incentive. And on the other hand, it provides information as to whether the enterprise is producing what users, whether consumers or other enterprises or public bodies, want to use. So that, I think, is the reason for the argument that they shouldn't just be allocated a quota of, of, of inputs, but they should be allowed to, if you like, look around, shop around and see if there are any cheaper or better inputs around on the market. But that's on the market for exchange, the exchange side of the market, not the market forces side of the market. Right. So like one of the big problems was quality and innovation in the Soviet planned economies. You know? Yes. I, d I recently yes. looked at, uh, I tried to find out, uh, as an example, I looked, I found a web page that described all the kind of innovations that were done in the USSR. And of all the innovations, there was essentially zero consumer goods innovations. Everything was military or high end primary research. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I think that that brings us on to <laughs> another area of, of discussion, which is, at least as I see it, that the reason why, or one of the reasons why, the Soviet economy developed in the way that it did is because the revolution in 1917 took place in a relatively backward country. And so the emphasis, bearing in mind Marx's view that communism, the higher stage of communism anyway, depends upon there being abundance enough to satisfy everybody's needs. But that inevitably in a backward country, as Russia was, means that there's a focus on increasing productive capacity. And so it became seen and developed into what some people call productivism. So you obtained abundance by producing more and more and more. Whereas if we think of 
capitalism today in most capitalist countries, including Britain, which is what the fifth or sixth richest per capita country, you still have food banks, people sleeping on the streets on the one hand, and, and then you have, um, you know, luxury gated apartments and uh, private jets swanning around and so on. So one's got to, I think anyway, think about abundance as being approached from the demand side as well as from the supply side. Once you've reached a degree of productive capacity that if it were properly used and distributed could satisfy basic human needs of everybody in the society, then you have to look at the demand side, which is how, if you like, income distribution is shaped and whether emphasis on consumerism, which is, you know, turbocharged consumerism, or whether we need to move towards a situation in which that is not what the, the thing that motivates most people is. And of course, another way of thinking about this is if one thinks of the, the brilliant slogan that the Brexiteers chanced upon, take back control. I mean, this hit a nerve for a lot of people because most people don't have any control, don't have much control, not because of the EU, but because of the system in which we live. There is one sense in which people have argued that turbocharged consumerism is a form of compensatory behaviour on the part of people who don't have much control over anything else. So I think coming back to your point about innovations in, in, in the Soviet Union, it's not surprising that they were mostly in the areas that you uh, identified because that was, became the focus of attention. How can we uh, increase productive capacity? Don't forget Lenin said socialism is workers' power plus electrification. The only, I thought you might be interested, the, the one kind of consumer innovation I found was, it's, you'd never guess it, but it's, it's children's railway, you know, like small trains. Apparently, yeah. this was a big thing in Russia. And my, my co-author, who I'm writing the book with, is in Russia at the moment. He's doing a master's in cybernetics in uh, Kazan University. And he was saying, God, that's weird because they're everywhere in Russia where he's living. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is interesting, yeah. 